And as we prepare to hear our gospel lesson, I invite us to remain to stand in spirit or as comfortable as we hear together the gospel of Matthew, chapter 11, verses 2 through 11. And, one, and I too will be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore hair of camel's clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then the people of Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him, and all the region along the Jordan, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers! Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, for, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. But one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear this his threshing floor, and will gather his wheat into the granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. May God add a blessing to the hearing, reading, and understanding of our gospel. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Let us be in prayer. Holy God, Holy Spirit, May you work for me as we hear this message this morning, and may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable unto you, our strength, our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. So how's your Advent journey going so far? Even though we've only been a week into Advent, have we said those words, are we there yet, as we make our way to Christmas? How many of us have thought that so far? Ah, oh, we're not too eager to get to Christmas quite yet. <laughs> yeah, it, it, does, it, it feels earlier than it is, actually. I was, I was saying, because I'm usually used to this be the first Sunday of Advent, not right after Thanksgiving. Well, I'll admit that I do feel a little off-kilter this Advent, but because I'm used, used to my favorite word, hope, being the first Sunday of Advent. Although last week we had peace. And, well, it's better now than never that we come to hope. With the way that the scriptural texts fall in the Revised Common Lectionary, which is the set of assigned readings for the global church, we started with peace last week, which makes sense because this is the time of year that we hear all about the coming of the Prince of Peace or peace and goodwill for all. And as we prepare to welcome the Prince of Peace and because we are always in need of peace in our world and in our hearts, like peace, we too are in need of hope. And I think that Andrea and Ava and Bella with Elsie summed it up really well, is all of us need hope. And, well, we have the version of the child shall lead them today, too, in our children's moment. Because that's where one of the sources of hope that I find, is the lessons of our children. Well, as we continue our Advent journey, we continue along this preparing for Christmas. And as you notice, our sanctuary has a few more greens now. Yeah, and it's beautiful, and we have our, some stars, and we have lots of the characters of the story, but we don't have Mary and Joseph and the baby or the kings quite yet, as we're still preparing, we're still waiting, and they're still making their journey. Well, even like the Holy Family, like the kings, that we too have this journey that we're going on through Advent. And our journey may take us through the desert or wilderness, might take us up to the mountaintop, might even take us through the valley 
We're across a waterway. And we may even have some unplanned stops along the way, too. Well, the only time that I've really traveled through the actual wilderness or desert was on my way to Washington, D.C. to begin my seminary journey. And so during that journey, my dad and I left Sacramento at 3 a.m. on a Wednesday morning, which 3 a.m. is an ungodly hour to be up, <laughs> although I applaud people who can do that. Except as we were going through after Reno and Sparks and going through the Nevada desert, got to witness a brilliant sunrise through that desert, the hope of a new day. And it was just so spectacular seeing that on the way there. As the desert can be a beautiful place, and likewise on the way back, my former roommate Josh and I went back through the Nevada desert on the second to last day of our road trip and got to see the sunset, which was equally spectacular as the sunrise is in the desert. A lot of the times, being in the desert is a metaphor for being in a dark place, for being in a difficult place, or a hardship in life. And even though being in the desert can feel isolating, can feel lonely at times, being in the desert can be a good thing too. Because being in the desert or wilderness can be a place of self-discovery. And so on that trip, both to and from DC, it was a time to self-reflect while marveling in God's creation and that beautiful paintbrush across the sky and the sunrise or the sunset, which I still marvel at the sunset as well, and oftentimes take a lot of pictures of sunsets. Well, the desert can be a place where you can encounter hope. And that's where we see each new day when the sun rises and sunsets, where we can see hope at work. Well, being in the desert causes us to look inside ourselves. And while looking at ourselves from the inside out is oftentimes associated with the season of Lent, which is the 40 days of preparation for Easter, it's a good practice to try during Advent as well. Repent or turn around is the message that we hear from John the Baptist in our Gospel lesson from Matthew. And it's that same message that allows us a time to recenter, to repent during the season of Advent which can bring a new sense of hope in how we live and how we prepare our hearts and minds as we await the birth of Christ at Christmas. Even when the hustle and bustle of the season can bring a little bit of anxiety or amplify intense feelings that we have at this time of year. So when we encounter John the Baptist, and, and John the Baptist is in all four of the Gospels, he might come across as a little bit scary at first, and not necessarily come across as the harbinger of hope. From what we can gather in the text, he's a little bit rough looking. Yeah, I, I agree, Micaiah. I think I could cry too, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> but from what we, he's a bit rough looking, wearing camel hair and eating locusts and honey, garnering the nickname from a dear friend, the bug eating hippie. <laughs> On the other hand, he reminds me of the outdoor TV reality host Bear Gryllis or Grizzly Adams. Yeah. We're from Travel Channel, Andrew Zimmer, who hosted that show, Bizarre Food, since he would probably eat locusts too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, even John the Baptist's approach is more like preaching a hellfire and brimstone sermon, calling on everyone to repent and to prepare the way of the Lord while calling the Pharisees and Sadducees who come for baptism, you brood of vipers. Which reminded me of a little comic I saw this week that had a picture of John the Baptist saying, Happy Advent, you brood of vipers. <laughs> I actually could have been this morning's bulletin cover. <laughs> so maybe it doesn't sound very hopeful on the surface. Well, while he might be ranting and raving and looking a bit rough, John the Baptist is actually the forerunner of Jesus' ministry and is Jesus' cousin, as in Luke's gospel account, when Mary goes to visit her cousin Elizabeth, she's the one who's pregnant with John, even though they're a few months apart. And oftentimes, if you've had a chance to see medieval or Renaissance artwork, John and Jesus are oftentimes depicted as infants together. Likewise, when we look at the prophecies foretelling the birth of Jesus, particularly from Isaiah, Isaiah prophesied about John being the one to 
prepare the way of the Lord by calling on everyone to prepare while they were in the desert. And, and as we saw, people would turn away from their sins and be baptized while embracing hope during John's time. Well, as I was reading an Advent devotional from Reverend Tear Hardy this morning, Tear's commentary explains that while John may come across as harsh, he was proclaiming the coming of the Lord, that Jesus' ministry would change everything by liberating Israel from the harshness of the law, as Jesus' ministry would turn many things upside down from the way that they used to be. As we oftentimes will hear, Jesus' ministry brought about an upside-down kingdom. Last week, as we began our journey through Advent, we heard some of the apocalyptic language in which Jesus is talking about the end of time and the end of the cosmos. Well, this week, we get similar language in which John is talking about one more powerful that is to come along, one that will baptize with the Holy Spirit, who will baptize by fire, even though John baptizes with water. Well, it's part of that staying awake and paying attention, too, that we talked about last week. Because here John is calling the faithful to action, to turn away from their sins and embrace the hope of a new day. On the other hand, when we hear about John calling people to repent, Reverend Dr. Derek Weber at Discipleship Ministries explains that John's call to, is to turn around, repent, and to think again. John's call is to think differently about ourselves and about our place in this world, about the one who comes, and about how we will follow, about who we are following. He tells the Pharisees to rely not on their pedigree. He asks them, what have they done lately? He asks how they have lived lately. Advent brings a challenge, says John, but Advent also brings a reminder of the destination of the world promised. The challenge is to measure ourselves by that vision and by that promise. Such a vision and promise of one more powerful coming, one who will baptize by the Holy Spirit, is where we can find hope. Especially as we rethink ways of doing things. Or how we relate to people, or how we see the world around us. On social, several social media platforms, Rethink Church, which is a communications part of the United Methodist Church, has an Advent Photo a Day challenge in which it'll give a word and everyone's invited to take pictures and post those pictures to their social media account and then use a little hashtag Rethink Church. And it's always interesting to see everybody's pictures because no two people see the world the same way. Except we have that hope that every day the sun will rise again and the sun will set again. And that we'll each have a new day. Well, likewise, repenting or turning around and rethinking ways of living is a way that we can live into that vision of the, and promise of God coming to earth in human form in the most vulnerable way, as an infant, and that's where we can find hope. When I think about Jesus' birth, I think of how each of us can experience a birth of hope at Christmas, even seeing the birth of faith or a rebirth of our faith. I find hope knowing that Jesus came to earth in the, not the most grandiose or powerful way, but in the most vulnerable way, in a stable, in a feeding trough. And the first people to know about his birth not the kings and the kingdoms, but the shepherds, who were at that time of Jesus' world, the lowest of the social classes, out working in the fields and the elements, the first people to know about the new hope that arrived in Bethlehem. Well, amidst the way that Jesus was born, Isaiah prophesies that Jesus will be the Messiah, the little child that should lead them all <laughs> and bring about this future filled with peace and hope. Even though sometimes it might take a long journey to get there and with many pitfalls or unplanned stops or even times where we ask, are we there yet? 
So what we might ask, are we there yet? On this journey of Advent, taking that time out of our day to pause and reflect, to engage in different spiritual practices and quieting our heart can give us that time to think about our motives, to think about what it means to be faithful, and reflect on preparing the way, even repenting of or turning around from any ways that we fall short of God, and reflecting how a little child shall lead us. In our Advent faith formation this week, almost Christmas, a Wesleyan Advent experience, in our chapter on an altogether hope, which we'll discuss tomorrow and Wednesday, Reverend Ingrid McIntyre shares how John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, saw poverty, inequality, and injustice, and a sense of hopelessness around him, much like there could have been, much like there was in Jesus' time as well, as there was poverty, and as there was injustice and inequality happening. Well, for Wesley, instead of going to the king or queen, he went directly to those who suffered right where they are, in the streets, in the fields. When we think today about our motives, ways to prepare the way of the Lord, and to think about our faithfulness towards God during this Advent journey, think about how you might be called to bring hope to someone and to everyone around you by going to where they're at, not necessarily expecting them to come to any of us. A week, some examples of where we've seen hope these last few weeks is that a couple weeks ago, before Thanksgiving, some of the members of our Rotary Club bagged up 175 Thanksgiving meals at the Crisis Center, along with delivering hot meals the day right, the day right before Thanksgiving from Safeway. And that was a way of bringing hope to people around us. The angel tree at the bank is another way that we can bring hope to children around us. Or like last year when Herbie took a bunch of toys, did the toy drive for the children in Congo that were affected by the campfire. That was an example of bringing hope. Or even where we spend our money, such as donating money towards causes in our town, such as the Crisis Center, or Community Assistance Network, or the, when the Salvation Army is out there in front of the stores. Donating our money is a way to help because that money will go towards helping people with shelter and with other needs. And that's a way that we too can bring hope to people. And even just being present with someone who feels hopeless or is grieving, because as we said, feelings are very much amplified at this time of year. Just being present can be a way to bring hope our fall dinner a, couple, a few weeks ago, or our Wednesday community supper, or our Monday hot pot lunch, is another source of hope. Because I see a vision similar to what Isaiah has in this morning's reading, where people are coming together, people from all walks of life, even amidst differences. Everyone's coming together at the same tables, enjoying table fellowship and good food. It brings hope. And even, so putting our hands to work by being the hands and feet of Christ is how God tells us to go. This is what hope looks like close up. We carry it with us. The hope of Christ moves through us so that he is born again. And again. And again. Every moment of every day. In every moment of every day, not just on Sunday, and not just at Christmas time either, but through all the whole year round. So while we might ask, are we there yet? As we make our way to Christmas, we need to keep preparing the way of the Lord. Keep reflecting. Keep striving for a vision of peace. Keep repenting or turning around from ways that we sin. 
and keep being a hopeful presence for anyone who we encounter. While we are on this journey of Advent, we might need to go through the desert to get to our destination. And being able to repent or turn around is one of the ways that our faith can be reborn, that our hope can be reborn in each of us. It's another way that this is God's greatest gift to us, the one that's going to be born in an angel, the one that will bring us the gifts of peace, hope, love, and joy. It's a new beginning. It's a new chance. The sun coming up on another day. And it's a message that we need to continually hear, even if it sounds like a broken record or a parrot that won't be quiet. So as we go into this new week, and as we continue this journey of Advent, how are you going to be a hopeful presence for someone? And, where, and even think about where do you see hope around you? And what are some things where you feel where you might need a change of heart? In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, let the church say, Amen. Amen.